Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, also to people who have joined us uh, from uh, abroad. Uh, I am KPS Kohli. I'll be the moderator for the session for today. Uh, before I start this uh, session, there are a few high, uh, housekeeping rules uh, regarding how I intend to uh, take the webinar forward. One is that there is a Q&A uh, box that you see at, uh, on your screen. Uh, feel free to uh, put in your questions on that uh, box. And after the webinar, I intend to take uh, certain questions uh, and, share, and ask my panelists for, for it. And I'll be taking uh, through the uh, through the webinar, and I'll be putting the questions to the uh, to the panelists. And I straight away uh, go to the uh, I'll start the session. Uh, the modern commercial arbitration, as you understand and practice today, has taken centuries to evolve, and it continues to evolve even uh, even today. Uh, the need for commercial arbitration has its genesis in the man's quest uh, for enterprise. With the rise in civilizations, businesses thrived. However, with the rise uh, in commerce, the commercial disputes increase. Toils from the disputes contributed to the evolution of the commercial jurisprudence, which has the basis for international commercial arbitration. And I, this is what we, I intend to discuss with the panelists uh, today, as international commercial arbitration, or arbitration as we understand, is probably the most efficient mechanism to, uh, to resolve commercial uh, disputes. And in today's global world, the role of international commercial arbitration cannot be stated less. I mean, to, uh, to resolve the disputes internationally amongst parties, I think uh, rather than going to jurisdictional courts of uh, different countries where there could be allegations of, bias, of, uh, of home bias, I think international commercial arbitration has uh, come up as the most efficient uh, method where parties can get an effective, uh, uh, effective remedy and a resolution. And uh, with the uh, unicetral model, which is followed across uh, majority of the world, you can also are assured of your uh, execution and, and the results and the fruits of uh, your toil during, uh, after the arbitration. So, uh, but with the, with the pandemic happening, I think there has been a lot of change in how we conduct the arbitrations today, domestically and internationally. Uh, with the pandemic, I think across the world, there has been restrictions, countries have been put under lockdown and uh, severe uh, movement restrictions of people, which has affected not even the conducting of the business, but also how uh, we conduct our dispute resolution mechanism. And that is why we thought to organize this uh, webinar. And I, I, and I have very erudite speakers. One is uh, Ms. Manisha Dheer, and uh, uh, my friend from Singapore is Mr. Ajinder Pal Singh. So uh, Ms. Manisha Dheer is the managing and co-founding, uh, uh, co-founding, founder and managing partner of Dheer and Dheer Associates. Ms. Dheer is highly uh, reputed litigation lawyer with over three decades of expertise in handling wide range of cases uh, in commercial litigation, uh, arbitration, both domestic and international, insolvency laws, telecom, uh, telecom laws, uh, M&A, corporate consistency. She's, she's, regular, she's a regular speaker at various global conferences. Uh, and she has uh, been bestowed with many awards and has received many accolades for a married contribution such as National Bar Award by the All India Bar Association in recognition of her dedication to the study of commercial litigation, Woman Lawyer of the Year uh, 2020 Award by the Public Diplomacy Forum, uh, ranked among India's top 15 dispute resolution lawyer by Asian legal bus uh, business besides being recognized as a leading uh, lawyer by Chambers and Commerce, IFLR, uh, Legal 500, Indian Business uh, Law General, Asia Law uh, Profile. She is the co-chair of uh, IWIRC India Network since its inception and vice president of Women in Law and Litigation, aimed at encouraging women to achieve excellence in the field of law. My second panelist for today is Mr. Ajinder Pal Singh. Uh, Ajinder Pal is a senior partner in the litigation uh, and dispute resolution and arbitration practice group at Denton, uh, Denton's Roderick. Uh, Ajinderpal practices focused on partnership and shareholders uh, dispute, insolvency and banking litigation. He has acted for both minority and majority shareholders, uh, representing a diverse range of clients, including public listed companies, uh, foreign joint venture partners and homegrown family businesses. He has been involved in partnership disputes between local law firms and international uh, firms. Ajinderpal has a broad based a uh, diverse range of uh, arbitration experience. He, was, uh, he has been involved in ICC. Uh, ICAC and ad hoc arbitration. He is well uh, versed with the, uh, issues related to enforcement of legal awards, uh, including applications for setting aside such awards. Uh, he has presented uh, 
represented an investment fund uh, vehicle against a local listed company in dispute over investment in a uh, condominium uh, development project. Uh, he has acted for major uh, Japanese institution against an Indonesian joint venture uh, partner. Ajinder is a fellow of Chartered Account Institute of Arbitrators, Singapore Institute of Arbitrators, and an associate of Insolvency Practitioners Association of Singapore. He is recognized by chambers and partners in IFLR. Uh, for its restructuring and insolvency work. Additionally, Benchmark's uh, litigation rank, uh, ranks agenda as a dispute resolution star in commercial and transaction uh, and insolvency. So uh, I have a very erudite panel with me today on the to talk about arbitration and how uh, the virtual hearings have been affected or how we can actually uh, ensure that the virtual hearings are expedited, are more efficient uh, because probably virtual hearing is a new normal. So before I uh, I dwell into the question, probably I want to ask Ajinder first on what is his experience during this pandemic. And I and I realized that Singapore was under a lock was under a complete lockdown for for about over a month. And I think now the restrictions have been eased a bit. So during all this uh, period, I I I want to understand from you what has been your experience in uh, in conducting uh, virtual hearing virtual arbitrations. Thanks, KP. Uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, it's an afternoon here for me. This pandemic uh, has actually accelerated the development of virtual arbitration. The virtual hearings, virtual arbitrations are not new in the sense that already across, over the years, we can see a small shift towards that. What do I mean? For example, in the 80s or 90s, parties would have to fly to the UK or New York or wherever your international arbitration was going to be held for even small conference uh, meetings to decide procedural timetables. From there, we evolved to doing such uh, small uh, conference meetings by way of phone or virtual hearings. But now with the pandemic, everything is going virtual. Why? Because of the lockdowns uh, in every country and the restrictions on travel. So for us in Singapore, we have um, experienced these virtual hearings in, in two ways. Everything that is uh, before the courts is going through virtual hearing. Second is even arbitrations are going through virtual, virtual hearing. This by itself presents its own problems because for example, just last uh, Friday, I had a hearing whereby we are here in Singapore, um, the arbitrators are in Paris um, and another set of uh, the lawyers are in Kazakhstan. So timing was an issue. So what happened then we had to compromise we in Singapore had to take the call at 8 p.m. our time. And the hearing went on for a little bit longer than expected. It ended at 10 p.m. at night. So this is, the, this is the new norm. Instead of working from 9 to 5, we have to shift our hours to accommodate the virtual hearings. And um, um, in terms of hearings, we will explore during this uh, seminar as to how efficient is it? Is it better? Is it worse? And how do you prepare for it? Because I can tell you, it takes a lot of work to prepare for a virtual hearing, but this is the future and this is only going to increase. So thank you again, KP, for letting me say a few words. Uh, I have a lot to ask you during the, during the <laughs> arbitration. But uh, before I, uh, I come there, I want to ask Ms. Dheer uh, what, what has been her experience. And in fact, uh, Ms. Dheer has released last, year, last week had a, a, a big success is probably the biggest uh, arbitration award in a sports arbitration matter, about 8,000 crores uh, for Deccan charges against BCCI, the Board of uh, Cricket C Council of India. So I just want to ask her what has been her experience in terms of uh, doing virtual hearings, either before courts or before uh, the tribunals. And I think for, uh, for BCCI, for this Deccan matter also, there has been a, a virtual uh, award pronouncement. Uh, so KP, good morning to everybody. Uh, thanks, KP, for uh, mentioning that award. But interestingly, my one of my biggest experience was the pronouncement of award on a Zoom call. And uh, the, this, these matters were reserved some time back. But various applications were filed for not proceeding with the award. Eventually, the award got pronounced in, uh, twin, uh, uh, last week. And uh, it was an award in favor of Dekchen charges and 8,000 crores was awarded. Um, uh, the, my other experience as far as uh, arbitration proceedings con considered is where uh, partly we had uh, conducted the hearing uh, physically, but uh, after the lockdown was not possible, 
but during the pendency of that uh, well uh, to and fro agreements were being passed and and eventually uh, on a on a video conferencing those agreements were agreed and um, in fact they were mailed to the arbitrator uh, immediately at that point of time and the award came in subsequently uh, these are the two recent experience i have had on virtual uh, uh, hearing of uh, arbitration great so in fact i wanted to ask you uh, further on this that uh, since both of you have experience of uh, doing arbitration virtually so how do you think can we make it more uh, efficient in terms of since virtual is a new norm and as i understand probably going forward uh, this is here, here to stay so i think every calamity brings with it a uh, new necessity and necessity mother i mean necessity is the mother of in fact uh, uh, invention so i think people have now started looking towards uh, virtual hearings virtual uh, arbitrations virtual international arbitrations so uh, what is in your experience ms dheer would be the most efficient way to conduct a virtual uh, arbitration proceeding so keep it let ajit take that first because i think singapore is more um, you know streamlined in this respect uh, ajit can you take that first uh, with respect sure. how uh, and then i will discuss the indian scenario sure thanks mrs dheer um just coming back to the question on how we can we improve efficiency of virtual hearings this is uh, the hot topic of the year because uh, everyone is trying to see how we can better the system and what i can point to all of you is this there is this paper uh, by the icc it is called icc's guidance note on possible measures aimed at mitigating the effects of the covid-19 pandemic it's a very good uh, paper because it kind of describes exactly uh, what party should be thinking of in order to make their um, arbitration more efficient for example uh, right now we are in different cities in different countries but we are connected through the internet so the first thing the icc says is the parties need to actually decide on what system are you going to use first you got to decide you know in terms of your arbitration are you going to use zoom webex and what do you do about your witnesses uh, what do you do with the bundles for example is there going to be a, a different sharing platform for bundles so first the, the first and foremost you have to to make it efficient is you got to think about the system and the configuration for your system then comes other issues like uh, okay witness uh, cross examination if a witness cannot uh, be in the same uh, for example location as the arbitration then what do you do do you want to have the right to have uh, perhaps local representatives from the other party the opposing party who is going to cross examine be present in the room with the witness while he's being examined to make sure he is not uh, has had access to different material or he's not collaborating with somebody else on his answers so things like that need to be uh, 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 sorted through before the hearing then the other issue is rights of audience who leads you know now it's very common we have uh, five six seven lawyers in one team so before the hearing normally you have to decide um, who is the lead uh, uh, counsel what rights does he have is anybody else entitled to speak and what is the protocol for example if somebody else is speaking and i want to interrupt because he's made a point uh, that is fundamentally wrong what do you do do you interject uh, live like we are doing now or do you do it on the site somehow so there's a lot of thought that needs to be put uh, in place not a lot of thinking that has to be done before the hearing can take place and what then is the recommendation actually what this means is you have to come up with a cyber protocol the cyber protocol Ajita, lists sorry, out I, all of these things i'm sorry i need to interject yeah. can you please put on your mic a little closer to your mouth i think there is some sure uh, yeah that that's what it's not uh, is this better yeah yeah absolutely sorry sorry to interrupt apologies for that no problem so what what in effect we are seeing in international arbitration is a development of a need to draw up what is known as a cyber cyber protocol to address all these issues this is all well and good because what i'm saying is basically this is party agreement on the protocol the other problem is of course what if parties cannot agree then what do you do uh, uh, kp asked the question how do you improve efficiency so if parties cannot agree does that mean the hearing cannot take place this is where i think there is a divide between international and domestic arbitration at the moment all of the rules I, uh, whether you go for institutional arbitration whether be, uh, be it sic or icc 
all of them uh, have this very generic statement or generic rule that says the arbitral tribunal can decide on the procedure for the arbitration. Every institution has now come out to say this means then that every institution, every arbitral, arbitral tribunal has the power to decide whether or not a hearing will be held virtually. So again, if a cyber protocol cannot be drawn up by agreement, then the recommendation is parties put their proposals as to how the hearing can take place, uh, be it virtual or otherwise, and then the tribunal has to decide. And of course, under the rules, the tribunal can decide in favor of a virtual hearing, regardless of parties' disagreement. Of course, now everybody in the audience and um, uh, will be shocked because this means then your rights are being uh, impugned. And what does that mean? Does that mean set aside becomes easier? But this is where, again, there's a big uh, change in the international sector. Uh, internationally, worldwide, people are becoming more accommodating of virtual arbitrations. So, for example, in the Singapore courts, unless there is something that has gone fundamentally wrong, meaning you can show obviously a witness was uh, reading answers off a script or, you know, uh, in, a, in some other way it was being fed answers and therefore was, the cross-examination was ineffective, it will probably not be set aside. So this is where things are going in terms of virtual arbitration. It is a big shift, but again, on the flip side, in terms of efficiency, there is a bit of saving of money in the sense like, uh, let's look at it this way. If we are doing this webinar in a normal climate, I would be there in India in a five-star hotel uh, as compared to sitting in my living room and having this seminar. So the same for virtual hearings. You can do it in your bedroom as well if you want to. So in that sense, that saving can be caused, uh, passed down to the consumer, the clients who need virtual hearings. And that's my little bit of... Uh, intro into this topic. I hope uh, that helps. Yeah, definitely. So at, at least cost efficiencies are uh, involved in virtual uh, hearings. And I think you did made a very uh, good point on the right of hearing. There are a number of lawyers whom to access who can, since arbitrations are private uh, mechanism to uh, hold, give, impart justice. Ms. Deen, your uh, take on it. So my take on it is very interesting. I feel that unless the arbitration agreement itself excludes virtual proceedings specifically, according to me, uh, it includes virtual proceedings. So a person objecting to that because it's a pandemic situation, the arbitrator can always overrule and say that uh, the virtual hearings will go on. Like I, unless the contract specifically uh, excludes it because a hearing uh, means it could be physical, it could be virtual. And look at looking at the situation, the arbitrator, and looking at the urgency in the situation, the arbitrator can direct virtual hearings. Here, I have only one thing to add is that it could be later. One of the grounds, I mean, you, you, this is probably one of the issues, that somebody may say that I never got a proper right to represent myself because it was virtual and you know, all that, could be a difficulty later. But uh, my understanding of the thing is that hearing does not necessarily mean a physical hearing. It can be a virtual hearing and an arbitrator can direct for virtual hearing looking into the current pandemic situation. Uh, right. as, and as far right. as costs are concerned, definitely costs have, uh, uh, have a lot of bearing. In fact, um, my understanding is I was speaking to Ajinder just now and he was saying that the filing in, uh, has increased so much, I guess, because the costs of probably conducting an arbitration proceedings in Singapore have come down because of physically not to be present. Is that correct, Rajinder? That's totally correct, Ms. Dean. And actually, I agree with your point uh, that if the clause does not exclude, specifically exclude virtual hearing, then you can have a virtual hearing. But of course, what right now what is happening also is the recommendation is for new contracts. Uh, we try and make it crystal clear that virtual hearing is included. So the, the one guidance note is going ahead uh, maybe we try and make our arbitration clauses wider and include virtual hearings to avoid the problem that uh, you have just pointed to uh, in terms of enforcement and setting aside. That's one party may claim I, my right has been uh, infringed upon. I didn't have a proper hearing. Yeah. So, I mean, there is one more important aspect in uh, arbitrations, both uh, domestic and international, is uh, regarding appointment of an arbitrator. Whom do you choose as an arbitrator? And in my experience, personally, I can I can tell you that I my matter was fixed for final hearing 
an arbitration mm-hmm. fix for final hearing dates were given and then the lockdown happened and thereafter we did had a communication with the tribunal but probably it's not possible it's not conductive of them you know three of the arbitration panel joining in virtually so i'm talking of a domestic arbitration so my question is to you ajender and to ms deep both in terms of what do you think that in view of this pandemic situation and now a new realization that this can happen any time in the sense that probably the virus can resurge god forbid it doesn't happen but if it resurges let's say and we have seen cases happening we have seen re lockdowns putting in so what do you think would be the special considerations to be kept in mind uh for the uh, at the time of you know nominating an arbitrator so uh, in my case probably parties uh, uh, my clients are pushing for an arbitration hearing uh, but it seems like we are stuck till the lockdown opens up and things ease up and we 50 people can crowd in one room to conduct that arbitration so uh, what what is your take on what should be the uh, uh, consideration to be kept in mind while nominating an arbitrator having back of your mind that we may have lockdowns or parties may prefer to do uh, to virtual hearing uh, altogether even if everything lifts up everything goes back to normal so what do you think should be the consideration for it ms deep do you want to take that first or uh, so i I'll, i'll explain it in the indian context exactly uh, see consideration for a point in arbitrator we cannot decide because if there's a pre existing contract or a procedure provided as to who the arbitrator should be um uh, we we'll have to be appointed in that terms of the arbitral tribunal this is my view uh, going forward of course going forward where um, where we're talking about odrs and other things then uh, uh, you can uh, as far as considerations for arbitrator to be appointed would be that they should be tech savvy and a should be expert in that subject you're taking i think it that really works in terms of expeditious ar- arbitration and um, and in terms of virtual hearings because if if an arbitrator is tech savvy and is an expert from that field um i think arbitrations can go on very well in the virtual field right thanks mr the- um actually all that is correct you need somebody who is uh, legally tech savvy uh, experience in his field and expert in his field but recently i because of this pandemic uh, i have revised the list a little bit because purely my side faced the problem we had this arbitrator on a oil and gas dispute he was in his late 70s and he is based in lebanon he is an expert in this area concerning an oil field in lebanon but because we now have to do things with virtual uh, virtually one problem is i have to select the time zone for hearings to suit his time meaning we cannot have it uh, later than 7 8 9 pm his time otherwise the arbitrator may not be sharp enough uh, to sit through the entire hearing so nowadays given given what is happening you need to consider the age of the arbitrator you also need to consider how technologically savvy is he in terms of getting on to uh, zoom uh, using technology because again this arbitrator was not very sound uh, in technology and was having great difficulties logging on to things so a little bit of uh, that issue now is coming into the fore and the other third thing is this again it's linked to the technology part now of course one big issue we have is how do we get bundles to somebody else in another country um this uh, again bundle courier services uh, within a country are, are are fine but externally there is an issue there is a big slow down and sometimes in certain parts you cannot get physical bundles to the person so you need to make sure your electronic platform is stable it is a uh, it's private and kept to the parties and at the same time that the other side meaning your arbitrators or whoever uh, is needs access are able to access it and know how to use the systems because otherwise you know having an arbitrator with no access to documents obviously he cannot make a decision that is uh, useful to anyone so this is the new thing that you need to consider given the pandemic if you're going to go for a virtual hearing is your arbitrator someone who is suited for virtual hearing can he follow online is he able to take different time zones because different parties now you need to accommodate different timing and generally can he access things online so these are the new criteria this pandemic has brought up so just one thing i just was just debating in my mind that if there is a contract which agrees agrees to a Uh, 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 arbitration tribunal in the contract itself and the procedure. Uh, looking at yeah. the new situation, is uh, 
can they consent to a new arbitrator uh, because of the pandemic in, uh, who has more tactics savvy or otherwise. So I think we must explore this option also that even if despite the fact in the contract, there may be an existing procedure for appointing an uh, uh, arbitrator or arbitral tribunal, maybe this could also be explored in terms of seeing that who an arbitrator could be with the consent of the party. You're, you're exactly correct. And this has a great impact even for us on domestic arbitration. Because uh, for us still, the choice for domestic is always a, a retired ex judge And unfortunately, they are not the most uh, tech savvy. So, you know, what you say, Ms. Deer, is actually important that uh, parties maybe have to think uh, practically and try and consent to a change in these times. Otherwise, you won't get any hearing uh, through properly at this point in time. Yeah. But, um... And my question is to both the panelists on the uh, next one that under this scenario, uh, what do you think that, uh, what are the kind of hearings that you think, what is the nature of hearings that you think can, can take place? Especially uh, keep in mind that you know, evidence collection could be a challenge uh, in these times. So what is your view? I mean, if Ajinda, you want to take it up first. Sure. Actually, at the moment, my own view is this. Um, and um, when you come to arbitrations, virtual hearings are best for hearings with legal issues only, meaning if it's uh, something that can be done through documents or just on a point of law, people can hear arguments and have submissions before them. Those kind of uh, not fact intensive hearings are the best suited for virtual. Sometimes when you have, uh, when you, if you turn the page to a hearing, a full hearing where there is need of cross-examination, this can be problematic because while I've made the point that your arbitrator, at least you can choose if, uh, and KP, we were talking about this just before your experience. Um, if you have a witness who is slightly older and you cannot choose the witnesses, uh, are they able to take a virtual hearing? Are they able to perform? Uh, put aside the issues on cross-examination and needing, uh, needing to make sure that they are not uh, tampering with the evidence or collaborating. The other problem is the witness themselves. Can they perform uh, for cross-examination virtually? It may be a problem. So to me, while I've said virtual hearings is the norm, uh, my preference would be to try and have it just for documents only or legal issues. And if I can avoid a virtual hearing where arbitration is, uh, cross-examination is needed, that would be my own preference. But again, given these times, it may not be totally possible. Right. Be it, uh... So, what so what you think uh, would be an appropriate hearing? So what Ajinder is saying is absolutely correct. Uh, uh, Expert-based or document-based and all that, uh, if the virtual hearings are conducted on that basis, I think it is it is perfect and it can go very expeditiously. But where cross-examination is required and where witnesses have to be examined, I think it's, it's a bit of a challenge because, like you said, tampering or tutoring uh, is possible at that uh, uh, point of time. But recently, about a, some time back, we did a matter where, where cross-examination took place in India and in, in US. Mm. And um, it was a force. It went on till two o'clock at night. Um, it did take place and finally things did work out. But yeah, it is a bit of a challenge where witnesses, where, and how to put documents to witnesses. Because there's a, there's a chance, you know, there's a chance that when you put a document to witness, he may say that this is only a, it's a scanned copy or a photostat copy or something that I will not um, uh, deny or accept it. So there, there's a bit of a challenge as far as uh, cross-examination and putting of documents is concerned uh, in, in arbitration proceedings, but these kind of things are required. And I think ideally virtual con um, uh, co conducting of uh, arbitration proceedings would be in the manner in which Ajinder was saying where it is basically document based and even expert based it, because expert reports are, are there on record to be examined and uh, uh, virtually, uh, virtual proceedings can go on in those cases. Right. So in fact, uh, I probably want to digress a bit. I want to ask you, what do you think that is more important? Uh, a fact-based witness or a expert witness? I'm only talking about uh, arbitration scenario and not a uh, regular commercial suit or dispute before court. So in an arbitration, what do you think uh, the importance of a fact-based witness over an expert? Um, if if I, mean, I may, Ms. Ms. Deer. Yes. Actually, I forgot to one mention, mention this one point. Um, when it comes to virtual hearings, the other thing that is developing internationally is this, and I'm sure it's the same in India. 
all of the judges and the tribunals are saying, look, we are, we are all experienced people. So this emphasis that parties are playing on cross-examination, placing on cross-examination may be misplaced because cross-examination at the end of the day is more of an issue of credibility. And really, at the end of the day, in terms of a contractual dispute, if you have the documents, I can read them, I can make the case out quite easily. So not so much terms of cross-examination, which is why now the thinking is expert uh, witness, expert evidence is more important than factual. And as Ms. D pointed out, experts are experts. So their reports are available and they are used uh, to giving uh, proper opinions before the tribunal because this is their daily bread. You know, their job is expert testimony. So in that sense, uh, KP, to answer your question, expert uh, testimony is becoming more important than factual. Because right now, because in this time and age, parties are very good at documenting disputes. You know, everyone knows when you have near dispute time, the emails, the correspondence starts going out to give no, this was my understanding of the contract and this is how we performed and therefore what you're doing today is contrary to contract. So that gives a lot of documentary evidence for arbitrators to fall back on. But what they don't have is uh, evidence of custom in a trade, for example, or evidence of uh, industry usage of certain terms and practices. And therefore, again, to me, I think expert testimony is becoming more important than facts, factual testimony. Just adding one point to it, what gets lost, I'm just giving the flip side of it, uh, what gets lost, of course, expert, like I said, expert witnesses are very important, but what gets lost in uh, matters where fact, fact uh, witnesses are required is the demeanor of the witness is very important yes. at, at the time of, because this is a very crucial issue for an award to be passed. So I think that bit slightly gets lost in, in matters where you need fact witnesses. And I agree with you that in matters, in those matters, probably virtual proceedings would not be the best of, uh, of way of proceeding in the matter. And also, according to me, anybody who wants to delay the proceedings and not interested in going ahead with the proceedings has a got, got, has got an upper hand by, by saying that I will not participate in these proceedings because I have witnesses who all have to examine witnesses who I want to cross-examine. Just wanted to put that point across. Exactly. Right. So if you have too many packed witnesses, probably this is not a uh, virtual hearing could be a, a bit of a uh, handicap in terms of looking at the demeanor of the of the witness while you cross them. So that's a very good point. In fact, and uh, I, as we studied in law that even in the CPC in India, they have said they have said that judge when the cross examination happens has to actually look at the demeanor of the witness when the questions are being put to him. So that is also a big consideration while deciding or while relying upon a testimony that is being given. So I think that, of course, is still to, to evolve, and I'm sure this will evolve in uh, in future. But we did discuss about certain, uh, and uh, Ajinda also mentioned about his uh, problems that he's facing in terms of timing uh, and arbitration and where you have uh, people sitting in across the world doing a virtual uh, virtual arbitration yeah. hearing. So what do you think are more practical issues uh, that you face in terms of you know different time zones, uh, start and finish time, uh, breaks and length of each hearing. In an arbitration hearing, we are used to a two-hour hearing, then a tea break, then a two-hour hearing, then a lunch break, then again a two-hour hearing, and then again a coffee break. And then, uh, so that's how we we plan a arbitration day when we do a, a hearing or a cross examination physically. But on virtually, when people sit across the world, and probably a three-hour delay would be a midnight for me. So, uh, what do you think are the practical aspects that? Uh, and how do you manage it? I mean, how are you managing it uh, when you you know see across uh, across the world people sitting? How do you manage your time? I mean, the one drawback is this: at the moment, the recommendation is you work everything out on paper first, meaning the exact timetable. So start time, end time, break time, agree up front. Why is that important? Because um, if I'm going to start my arbitration, let's uh, exaggerate it, middle of the night midnight and the other person is starting it first thing in the morning he's got an advantage so the only way i'm going to agree to starting at a very late hour is that if we have only a short hearing you know maybe an hour or two so that i don't get uh, worn out or i don't get sleepy for example so this means then your timetable gets stretched out a hearing a hearing that is supposed to take uh, three days or four days can now take eight days because of time zone differences 
So this is this is a problem that cannot be solved uh, because the time zones are something that we've got to live with. And what, what we have to do is practically sit down and discuss what is reasonable. And this is where the greatest challenge is because if a party wants to delay, everything becomes unreasonable. And so time right. zones, not an easy problem, but you have to face it head on with the other side. Right. Uh, so yeah, Katie, that's like exactly uh, time zones is a bit of a challenge here. And uh, like uh, just repeating myself that anybody who wants to delay the issue can always delay it. And rightly pointed out by Ajinda that uh, whatever would have taken three days because of the uh, time zones and all that could take eight days, 10 days, depending upon how you agree to, to fix a timetable. And the timetable has to be agreed much in advance and cannot be just randomly fixed if the time zones are too uh, far away, uh, far apart. And um, uh, I think it's a bit of a challenge here again, I would say, as far as virtual proceedings are concerned. But that challenge would have been there in physical proceedings also, because if there are, uh, I would say, uh, what is the good side is that you mm. uh, costs are reduced. So there is no mm. need to be physically present. You may be, you may be a little uh, 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 problematic on the times you are doing those, conducting those hearings, but as far as uh, costs are concerned, this substantially reduced in case if you are placed far away physically. I think exactly. both sides to the... Uh, the That's exactly right. Yeah. And probably uh, next question I'm moving towards is one of my key concern areas in terms of, do you think that hour of oral uh, persuasion or advocacy uh, is under threat uh, in a virtual hearing? And especially if uh, now we also hear a lot where people say that for a smaller arbitration dispute, probably we can only do a documentation based uh, arbitration. People file documents and written submissions and then arbitrate decides on the basis of um, of what is being presented in written form to him. So do you think that that, that art that we all learned and we, we read about uh, people that how they were able to persuade a, a jury in the past and now the judges, so do you think that is under threat or do you see any uh, handicap while virtually presenting a case and probably the forcefulness that shows in our expression and the movement of our hands uh, probably has, or the way we shift while we, we argue. So do you think that is under threat in any way in virtual hearing? Uh, Ms. Deer, probably I, I would want you to answer first because I have assisted you in many matters and I know <laughs> how, how do you conduct a court hearing. So, so probably what, what is your take on it? So definitely, I would say that there is a handicap there because uh, your mannerisms, the passion that you present the case physically, uh, I would say the vibrations across, you see the judge's face directly, you know, his, the way he's moving, then you can change your, you know, this, uh, the way you are saying something. I think it really, there is a bit of a handicap in virtual hearings and physical hearings. I think physical hearings have a great advantage over able to persuading a judge um, uh, otherwise. I don't know what Ajinder said on that. <laughs> Actually, um, even before the pandemic, in, in Singapore and in, in, in international arbitration, what is happening is I do feel the art of advocacy is actually going down because um, right now the written is carrying more impact than the oral. I, I don't think it's right, but that unfortunately seems to be the development of uh, matters. Just to give you an example, uh, just last year I had a hearing before, uh, it was a domestic arbitration, not international, but the hearing was conducted before uh, three arbitrators and one of whom was my former boss. Now the other side, the lawyer was a little bit uh, with respect uh, weaker and she was not uh, presenting her case well. So what happened then was the arbitral tribunal just told me and says, don't worry, everything is going to be on the written. Let's speed up. I don't want you to give long, long submissions. And that unfortunately is what is happening. Apart from advocacy turning to submission, judges are also now and arbitrators do the same, they're compensating. That if, if you have a weaker advocate on the other side of the table, the judge or arbitrators tend to step in to try and balance the playing field. And so as a whole, things are moving uh, in Singapore towards submissions. So in a sense, uh, cross-examination skills and even uh, oral advocacy skills are diminishing in importance. It, it's an unfortunate thing and I don't like it, but it's something that's here to stay. That, that's true. And people who, who appear in courts regularly are finding it very difficult to, you know, you know 
uh, argue virtually because I think the like I said the body movements, the way exactly. the judges are responding or the arbitrators are responding to your to your uh, submissions makes a lot of shift to what you're arguing. If you find that he is not you know with you, then you That's try right. to make arguments, which I think sometimes get lost in the virtual world. Right. So, uh, but what do you think that uh, I mean? This is of course uh, of the arbitrations that are pending. But if I talk about what do you think that if uh, we have to enter into a fresh arbit start an arbitration in now or probably enter into an agreement now, so what do you think that one should keep in mind uh, for the purpose uh, of you know taking care of all this? A written uh, probably predetermined that there'll be a half an hour oral hearing. Yes. There'll be uh, so. Do you think that for going forward, the party should apart from uh, deciding the uh, arbitrators, these tech savvy. Uh, his age is to be considered, and do you think that all these uh, factors should be built in into an arbitration uh, sort of a mitigation uh, factor, so that when a dispute actually arose, what can be done? So, what is your take on it? Actually, uh, sorry if I may. Actually, uh, KP, that is the recommendation nowadays um, that you come up with a proper protocol that covers all these issues, and it's helpful in a way as well because if you can agree to all this upfront, then when it comes to a challenge on the award, it's much more difficult to set it aside because you've had an agreement on the procedure. But uh, then again, as we all know, if you're going to cover everything, including hearing times, whether there, there can be agreement practically is another problem. So to me, I think in the more international cases uh, where you have uh, both sides have a lot of money at stake and want to get a result, then in those kind of cases, the protocol becomes easier to implement. But in different type of, another type of case, for example, an estate uh, dispute that is going for arbitration where there's a lot of emotion and anger, for those kind of cases, very hard to see any kind of agreement on this kind of areas. And so, yes, uh, it is gonna be more developed, but it's gonna be developed on the basis of the case specific. For the more commercial cases, you're gonna see a better protocol in place. Right. Is the, uh... So KP, uh, my view is I see OTR has been in place for a long time, online dispute resolution. I think uh, the future would be, in my view, that uh, uh, that online dispute resolution would be the way forward. And uh, I think because in online dispute resolution, apart from the, the acts or whatever, uh, entire procedure, rules, everything is already prescribed. So there is no, I mean, there is, um, uh, of course, arbitrator has a leeway to prescribe his own procedures, but if, if anybody is agreeing to an online uh, dispute resolution, I have seen those uh, those rules and everything in place, it really works. I think the new way would be, in, in fact, in, in, in the fresh contracts is an online dispute resolution would be a very good way of moving ahead in these matters. Right, but with I online- on that. Sorry. I think that what is your view on online dispute resolution? I think it's here to stay. I mean, in every country you hear this word online dispute resolution, it's, uh, it's, it's become almost second nature to all of us now, especially in the legal field. So you're right, Ms. Deer, I think it's going to become even more developed in time. And it's uh, as uh, practitioners, we need to get used to it because it's not going to go back to the old style. Yeah. It won't go back to probably the, the normal. It will be in remain as a new normal. But yes, uh, on the online dispute, uh, I mean, if you do every virtual hearing and online, probably there is some some difference in terms of um, how you how you treat it. So, but do you think that uh, it does bring in its own uh, challenges in terms of uh, age of dispute of seat versus venue? Internationally, I, I believe it is well defined, but in India, there have been not uh, much of a clarity and to be honest at times people uh, don't clarify or specifically mention the seat of the arbitration which leads to a lot of dispute which goes on for years so uh, i want to take agenda uh, your take first and then go to Ms. Deer because india has its own challenges in terms of seat and venue dispute but uh, do you think on a uh, virtual hearing on an online uh, platform how do you take care of a uh, of a seat how do you define it and if you have not defined it what do you think should be the way forward? Um, I think KP, you know, just again, we, we had, uh, it was good that we had this conversation, especially with Ms. Deer just before this uh, presentation. You know, and as we discussed, if the contract specifies the seat, 
then actually this becomes a non-issue because seat is the legal term. And uh, if you have any issue in terms of how the arbitration was conducted, or you're going to set aside the award, is the seat, the, the country in the courts, uh, the country in which uh, the, uh, the seat, as in the country specified as seat, those countries' courts will have jurisdiction over the arbitration. The problem is, uh, at the moment, a lot of people are theorizing that even if the seat is uh, specified, but you have arbitrators and counsel and witnesses all over the world, then you have a problem because one issue is, has the seat changed, for example, or has, are you now facing an issue of multiple seats to a non-issue? If the contract specifies the seat, the seat never changes. Uh, because as we all know, you can have a seat, say in, uh, in uh, America, uh, San Francisco, but you can have the hearing in London, no problem. Physical hearing in London, but seat San Francisco. The, the problem is like you pointed out, if the seat is not specified in the contract, then you have a problem because a lot of parties can then take advantage to say, no, the seat is uh, uh, perhaps London because three out of the five witnesses were present in London and one arbitrator was there as well. So it's a place of maybe closest connection. So th that is going to be the debate. And the recommendation again is this. If you do the arbitration clause properly from the start, meaning you have the governing law and the seat properly specified, then this issue should not arise. Right. Is it your uh, view on how do we deal with uh, seat in a venue dispute? I, so Ajinder is right. I mean, as far as the seat is concerned, it's specifically described in the arbitration clause. The difficulty arises when the seat is not described because most of the people confuse seat with venue. Your venue could be anything. It makes no difference. <laughs> so uh, the seat is what is described in the contract. Like in a, in a, uh, in a virtual proceeding, you, everybody may be in a different country or a different city. That doesn't give jurisdiction to that city or a country to, to uh, you know, to decide the other issues. So the seat is specifically described, and if if seat is not described, then like uh, it is open to challenge to any anybody to challenge saying, uh, challenge award saying that the seat is 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 the seat where we conducted the hearings physically, or. I, I really am, I can't really answer the question if four people are situated in four separate cities, what is this jurisdiction, unless seat is determined. So I think uh, I will have to leave, leave the debate at that because uh, it's going to be a difficult cause if, if the witness is in one place and the plaintiff is in one place, dependent is one place, arbitrator is sitting in one place. So unless seat is described. Contract, the contract also and happened online it. and then there's a default. So I don't know whether cause of action, the original CPC will uh, apply or what will apply is, is a bit of a, I would say it's a bit hazy at this point of time. Uh, when we move on uh, and see matters being conducted like this, we will understand what, what would be there. But see, it is uh, normally uh, very specifically uh, described and we should not con confuse it with venue at all. Yes, right. Correct. So that's a very important takeaway. I think everyone who's uh, drafting an arbitrator, whether an uh, arbitration agreement, whether a lawyer or a party negotiating a contract, I think seat is the most important factor that they should keep in mind. But I have so many other questions to ask you, but I think the time is a constraint. So I'll ask you some certain questions which are very relevant now in terms of uh, pandemics uh, and during the pandemic. And we never thought the pandemics would stretch for so long, especially in India. It was a day one day lockdown, one day curfew, and then two days after it was a lockdown, which continued for over a month. And still the restrictions have not, uh, uh, all the restrictions have not been lifted. So what do you think are the remedies available to the parties? And my question is to Ms. Dheer, uh, in terms of uh, seeking interim relief before courts and tribunals uh, uh, under section 11, uh, or, I mean, appointment or section nine, any interim uh, dispute. So if considering travel, uh, travel constraints, what do you think is your um, uh, what's your take on it? That in pandemic times, how the courts are, are dealing with interim injunctions and uh, reliefs? So, uh, so courts are dealing very efficiently. In section nine, uh, where petitions have been filed, uh, and where they see there is a need to preserve the assets or need to uh, you know, pass orders with respect to any injunction being sought by the party who's approached the court, they are granting those injunctions. And recently, I think one of the one of the judgments, Delhi High Court, has um, passed an injunction. Uh, against uh, invoking the bank guarantees. So, uh, and of course, these hearings are taking place on virtually and um, section nine reliefs are being granted because these are urgent petitions where you are asking for courts to, to and we have dealt in, in Delhi itself and a, a, a whole lot of section nine petitions. We are doing 
at the moment and we are and courts are in in case they feel the need uh, to preserve the assets or other requirements they are granting those injunctions right and najinder what what's your and how quick are the tribunals uh, in terms of granting interim injunctions and probably an emergency uh, arbitration situation especially yeah. in pandemic when movement of everyone is is a challenge probably probably the first time the entire I mean, civilized world was under lockdown actually on this part because uh, the system was already de developed for interim relief in uh, in arbitrations um, emergency arbitrator relief has already been built in so the the pandemic has not affected this bit of the process you can get your injunctions uh, interim relief within 24 hours no difficulty there and uh, again hearing takes place online the, the courts in terms of courts courts uh, there was a bit of change it used to be you had to appear physically before the judge for interim relief right now there is a dual post process depending on the judge's preference you we either do it through online or if the judge requires it we physically we can be present before the judge so uh, not much has changed interim relief is still being granted quite easily and quickly in that sense it's still uh, the old normal in that sense but courts were uh, accepting physical hearings in Uh, in Singapore, they are allowing um, people to come and do we, physical hearings. Yes, we 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 have an exception under our COVID re uh, restrictions that for essential hearings, the court is allowed to hold them physically. But again, these are very small hearings. For example, if the court wants to hear injunction, no more than maybe three four people in the courtroom. Uh, that's where the change is. Maybe you cannot have big teams. You 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 certainly cannot have a hearing with fifty people in the courtroom. So if it's less than five, the hearing can go ahead. at the at the judge's discretion if he prefers right. to go online we can do that as well right which is uh, which i think is a very good thing that if uh, access to justice is not denied even in this pandemic time especially um, uh, emergency relief or interim yes, orders which brings a lot of immediate relief to the aggrieved party so i think that's a that's a very excellent job that uh, they are doing and of course the interim uh, relief regime for uh, arbitration is already well defined even before the pandemic uh, but uh, what what is your uh, take on enforcement of an award so do you think that uh, the enforcement has been affected or will be affected in future uh, of an arbitration award i i think by enforcement you mean on the asset right the, as on the on the yes on the asset and probably asking for other party to pay up sure um uh, on the seizure side if it's in a, if you're looking at a singapore based asset land property or even shares there's no change there is again an exception the court bailiff and uh, uh, authorized representatives can go with the with the court bailiff to seize the property or even seize uh, chattels like the house uh, furniture whatever uh, shares also no no change so in that sense if the asset is in singapore the pandemic has not affected it but if your asset is international in another country especially a bigger one i think it, like in india it may be a problem depending where you're situated and miss miss dear is better place uh, to answer that question from that aspect if the asset is in in india what happens yes so i i would just start by saying that um, as far as um, in, uh, execution of awards and enforcement of awards is concerned one of the major issues which will come up is Uh, in case those awards have been passed in virtual hearings and the party was not inclined to do a virtual hearing and a direction has been passed to would would be an objection to the fact that he was not given a proper representation or that he was uh, uh, wanting witnesses to appear and then he may object or delay the enforcement of awards so this is my first point as far as mm. enforcement of awards since it is a very crucial point because uh, 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 like i said that uh, it's easy for a party to say that i was not giving uh, was not given effective hearing because there was it was fact based witness i wanted to present that and i wanted to present that and um, even otherwise as far as actual possession is concerned would be a bit of a challenge because uh, possibly the person who's uh, who's uh, property is to be attached may say that i have nobody there you can only attach it if i am here i'm just giving an example that uh, i need to have right. people there and um, i can't send anybody there because of these times and all that so again that there, there could be a bit of a uh, challenge there and um, in in fact even in enforcement of awards uh, again virtual hearings have to be before the court for enforcement of award you have to file before the court and um, uh, enforcement of award may not be taken uh, as an urgent hearing you know what i mean a section 9 may be taken as an urgent hearing 
but an enforcement of award may not be taken as an urgent hearing and may you know notice be issued and other party present so this is my view that there there would be a lot of challenge for uh, enforcing an award once that that award comes back but i think uh, in fact uh, india also doesn't have that exception of uh, bailiffs you know going and uh, uh, seizing a property during the pandemic so there was a complete lockdown and in fact virtual hearings was also a lot of a uh, uh, lot of issues it was only very extreme urgent matters that were that were placed so enforcement of uh, awards and even decrees uh, were a, sort of a suspe- under suspension during lockdown in india but things have now back to normal i mean uh, the lockdown have been e- uh, eased except in containment zones is what we uh, what is the norm so i think now execution and awards uh, can be executed uh, going forward so that's uh, what is from india so i see that um, i think we have a lot of questions which which have come up and time is very uh, less so in fact uh, during the uh, registration also certain people have asked us certain questions and uh, considering the time uh, i think uh, i won't be able to take all the questions but there is one thing that uh, uh, that re- recurring uh, uh, question that comes up is that and uh, this is to me here in terms of uh, objections to an arbit- uh, arbitration so do you think that uh, during the objection when the objections have been filed against an award and are pending so do you think that uh, the execution can uh, can go on or probably the same court can can hold the execution and also hear the uh, objections so kp these are very absolutely individual uh, cases section 34 are objections and execution of award is a separate matter so these are two two separate cases which have to go on independently of that and of course objections under section 34 have to be filed within the timeline as as prescribed under the act so if it is not pres- uh, filed within that t- timeline of what is prescribed under act then execution executing court will take its own view on it and proceed in the matter but if it is if the objections are being heard and then and and uh, under the new amendment if there is a specific stay then the executing can't can court can't proceed if there is no specific stay then the executing court can proceed so as far as section 34 is concerned and uh, executing uh, is concerned these are two two separate proceedings which, which go on a separate court. they have to be that, two separate proceedings they have right, to be so right so that is the amendment that was brought in uh, under the act and i think singapore already has the same, uh, the same process i mean two are yeah. separate proceedings yeah. and you have to specifically seek a stay to the execution but uh, ajinda i want to ask you how do you think the uh, arbitration sector uh, is has evolved during pandemic do you think the arbitration has dropped considering uh, lockdowns because as i mentioned in india probably the litigation burden at least fresh filings were virtually stopped for some time so do you think that uh, that's the same effect that had uh, in singapore no actually um, in terms of the arbitration sector actually there's been a pick up there have been more filings and uh, i think ms dear pointed to one of the reasons maybe because it's cheaper you know nobody has to travel but while the filings are at a record high the pace in which the arbitration is proceeding has slowed down meaning for example appointment of arbitral tribunal uh, the institutions like sic icc are taking a lot more time to confirm the appointment because most of the icc and sic staff are also working remotely so while filings are at an all time high the the way the case is progressing is slower that that is the big difference right so i think that's a big insight that the filings are on a all time high during pandemic so i mean with that i note probably i want to close the uh, the session for today uh, i'm seeing that uh, we have reached uh, almost a lot of time and thank you so much to the both of you for taking out time and joining us for this uh, arbitration and uh, and thank you for all our participants who have participated uh, i tried to see that i could accommodate a lot of questions but i think uh, the discussion was so interesting <laughs> i i didn't i thought that 5 minutes would be enough but i i, I see they are not so uh, all the people whose questions have not been asked answer them separately uh, by a reply email after the um, uh, the uh, this webinar is over and uh, i think we had a very excellent discussion and a uh, lot of key takeaways from it and i think ajinda set it right by saying that uh, arbitration is this is what i mean virtually it has been accelerated there's an acceleration because of uh, covid and certain excellent points were made in terms of how efficiency can be improved in the arbitration matter 
especially uh, we have to ensure that um, so what is what the cyber protocol who will speak you have to ensure your system efficiency uh, when you do a virtual hearing and also uh, what are the points to be considered while choosing an arbitrator now going forward uh, and agenda made certain points in terms of uh, the age of the arbitrator ms he said that uh, knowledge of an uh, of an arbitrator is very important so i think these are very key points that a person should uh, consider while uh, doing a virtual, while doing an arbitration agreement now going forward and ms deer also said uh, that uh, you can have a, sep- uh, a specific virtual hearing uh, clause in your agreement and ajinder seconded it by saying that uh, that would improve uh, that will ensure that later on there is no challenge to the uh, arbitration award because world over uh, we seen that in, uh, at least in various jurisdiction where uh, the courts don't look at merits of an, of an award but if there has been a procedural lapse uh, the award can be set aside so and the entire process would come to a not so i think that's an excellent point that uh, we can have a uh, specific clause with respect to virtual hearings and of course then parties have to the obligation is cast on parties to ensure they have robust system to do those hearings they can't say that uh, i i couldn't uh, you know had an access to a to a robust virtual hearing system so that's an excellent uh, uh, discussion we had and of, of course on the seat that while whatever you do you enter into a uh, to, into a physical arbitration contract or you enter into a virtual arbitration contract now you have to ensure that you define your seat clearly where do you want because that would be the jurisdictional court that will look at all the procedural aspects uh, and also to the challenge of your award so i think those are very key takeaways uh that we have from uh, from this discussion and i looking forward to if anybody has any question they can of course drop us a email and we'll be happy to reply uh, and all the question that we already have uh, i will uh, personally take back to them uh, with my uh, with my panelists and thank you everyone and thank you my panelists once again and thank you next fitness for organizing this uh, very efficient uh, online webinar so uh, thank you everyone and have a have a have a great day Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Kohli. Thank you, Manish, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Ajinda Pal. Thank you very much. Mr. Kohli, seeking your permission to end the webinar for everybody now. Thank you. Yes, I will now be ending the meeting for everybody.